Our individual worldviews are driven by perceptions, making perceptions as individual as there are people. They're our experiences, our environment, our dreams and desires and ideas, as well as everything else that affects our lives rolled into a concoction that becomes our reality. Philosopher William James said, thoughts become perception, perception becomes reality. Alter your thoughts, alter your reality. It was the perceptions of some dreamers in the late 1800s that created the model city, the city of churches, the soil pipe capital of the world, Annie's town, what today we call Anniston. There is little argument where the story of Aniston begins. You have to go back to Daniel Tyler and Sam Noble as they come into the area because of the iron resources. Before the Civil War, Sam Noble's father opened a foundry in Pennsylvania that burned twice and was being rebuilt for a third time in 1850. The Industrial Revolution was beginning to take hold. The nation was fracturing politically and Noble decided to move south to take advantage of the iron ore discovered in the region. The family business moved to Rome, Georgia in 1855 and quickly grew to become one of the largest foundry and mill facilities in the South. After the Civil War began, it was no surprise that the South contracted with the nobles to make Confederate cannons and cannon carriages. Long before the war ended, Sam Noble was imprisoned by Union troops for a while and even met with President Abraham Lincoln to discuss the post-war South. When he returned to Georgia, the entrepreneurial Sam Noble struck deals with Northern Federal agents to sell a quarter million bales of cotton that he would buy in Selma, Mobile, Rome, Savannah, and Augusta. New York merchant and shipowner George Quintard bankrolled his old friend Sam Noble's cotton deal. Noble's cut was 75% of net sales. Unfortunately at that time, General Sherman was making his infamous march to the sea, and he showed no mercy for the Noble ironworks. He ordered them destroyed. Undeterred, after his family rebuilt the Rome furnaces, Sam Noble was looking to build his business. And in Grace Gates' book, that's been a big help to me, The Model City of the New South. She tells the story of how Sam Noble came down by the train to Oxford, because Aniston didn't exist. He got to Oxford, rented him a horse, and then went horseback riding about the uh, woods and terrain, collecting the red rocks, she said. Well, that was iron ore rocks. He was also looking at one of the two blast furnaces the Confederates had built in Calhoun County, the Janey and Oxford furnaces used to make cannonballs and railroad steel for the South. Union troops had destroyed the furnaces. Noble reportedly had seen the Oxford furnace on a previous trip that he'd made to the region with Bishop Charles Todd Quintard. It was in the densely forested and hilly area called Pine Ankle an area too difficult for settlers to clear, so only a few folks lived there, growing small patches of corn and cotton they sold in Wetumpka. On a spring day in 1872, Samuel Noble, representing his family's car wheel works of Rome, Georgia, walked into a Charleston office of Alfred Tyler, and he was the Vice President, General Manager of the South Carolina Railroad. And Noble was selling wheels and axles and Tyler was buying. Tyler was the son of a versatile industrialist, General Daniel Tyler, who was interested in railroads and iron. As chance would have it, the General was in his son's office the day that Samuel Noble was pitching his wares. The general questioned Noble about the presence of iron ore in northern Georgia and Alabama. The Tylers and Noble decided to purchase the main ore deposits in Anniston, as well as the property needed to establish the new foundry in town. 
It was more than 1,300 acres bought with money from the Tylers, the Quintards, and several other New York businessmen. Aniston started really in 1873, and you had to work in one of the mills or foundries to live here. So they had a company store, commissary over here at 10th and Noble. They had uh, tokens that you could buy goods with and all. And that's the way you, you had to work here to live here. And that went on for 10 years till 1883 when they opened the town up for anybody to, to come in. And they were paid with money and a they called it um, a factory script or iron money, which was basically used in the store to buy items and all the items were discounted. So it left a, a feeling of fairness to all those who shopped there. And they had other dry good items, they had jewelry and trunks and other items that the other people in the surrounding areas would be interested in buying and not going to other markets. But they had a problem with the script because the government created a tariff on the script that was later rescinded by the Internal Rev Revenue, there was a 10% tax that basically they wanted to implement, but it was rescinded because it was not actually redeemable for money. Anniston wasn't the only iron town being built in the wake of the Civil War. Not too far away, Birmingham was coming to life in the Jones Valley. Bluffton sprang up in Cherokee County around that furnace there. Not too far away was Rock Run and its Civil War furnace coming to life. Battelle had the Lookout Mountain Iron Company and hundreds of houses, a school, and a hotel. Bluffton, Rock Run, and Battelle all failed and are now ghost towns. Many credit Aniston's success to the Noble and Tyler's desire to do it right and invest not just in the facilities, but also in the people they lured to the model city. The employees really loved Samuel Noble and Daniel Tyler because of that fact, because a lot of industrial cities at the time, they had really poor housing conditions. They were put in rooms with very little circulation and there's a lot of disease. So the Tylers and the Nobles really believed in keeping their employees happy and healthy, and they really provided for them in so many ways. Anniston was the first city in the state of Alabama to have electricity in a practical way. And it was made from the number two foundry and sent to 10th and Noble. And years later, a dam was constructed on Chocolaca Creek uh, down below the racetrack. And the line was came, came from Chocolaca Creek to Anniston with electricity. The white way markers that were on Noble Street, the big markers years ago that had uh, globes on them that now you see you even they were made here at the foundries here invented here go to new york city and they're there too that's why they were called white way the great white way you know so a lot of things a lot of things were, were invented invented here the aniston electric company also owned the trolley service that ran from downtown all the way to oxford lake the lake was nothing like it is today. This is my grandfather. Worked here in Aniston for the power and gas. It was all one thing. And Aniston owned Oxford Lake. And so he worked for them 
for the, and he, Oxford Lake, and we used to ride the trolley down to the lake, and they had everything, they had a zoo, the alligator, the monkeys, the mirrors, the boats, everything. Everybody went, rode the trolley, that's what they would tell me. Pete Morgan's grandfather, L.G. Jones, spent a lot of time at Oxford Lake as a side hustle to his car dealership, the first in Anniston. In addition to all that, he did um, Surrey racing down at Oxford Lake. And uh, he, he really loved horses. He had a fast horse and, a, uh, you know, the Surreys are the little uh, one-man uh, racing carts that are behind the, the horse. but. Uh, Anyway, he had a, a very fast horse, and uh, um, people used to bring their horses in, they'd race them, <laughs> and he'd take on some winnings. But uh, Oxford Lake was a, another option for Sundays, and uh, um, we'd go down there and get to ride the Ferris wheel and uh, um, get the boats out on the lake. And <clears throat> at one time, my dad had traded for a um, Chris Craft speedboat and kept it down at Oxford Lake <laughs> and and they uh, he had somebody that um, had it um, or you know that drove it and um, they took people for rides around the lake in a <laughs> Chris Craft speedboat <laughs> beautiful all wood boat but uh, anyhow it was a, it was a lot of a lot of fun uh, times were were pretty easy back then Rides for children. Uh, I remember a Ferris wheel. You got to ride in boats. Daddy took us out in um, one of the boats for a ride. Um, I think we had uh, swings, not just the regular swings that you see for children in their own private, yeah, the ones that go round and round. That was one of my favorite things. I loved that. That was a big draw, Oxford Lake. You could go down there and they had rowboats and a bowling alley and a uh, merry-go-round and a zoo, a small zoo. Uh, I guess that, that was the attraction for them. The climate, I, I've read somewhere that the climate down here was better uh, than up north and uh, they just they like to come down this way and, and visit. <laughs> One of the major attractions was the 1912 Herschel Spillman wooden carousel that was at Oxford Lake Park until 1950, when it was sold and moved to Myrtle Beach. It is now at that city's Pavilion Nostalgia Park as a boardwalk attraction. Uh, pardon, may I help you? Aniston was also one of the first towns in the state to have phone service. In fact, there were two phone companies competing for business, the new Southern Bell Company and the Noble Pan Electric Company. Noble's company advertised cheaper rates, while Southern Bell offered free installation. But our first telephone was an eight-party line. And when you pick up the phone... If you could get a line, the operator would say, number please, and you give them the number, if you were able to get the line. But basically, we only used the telephone uh, in case of emergency. Uh, it was very important. The telephone company has had several different ways of making a call. The first, was well, you picked up the phone and you called the operator and gave her her number and she plugged it in and you got to talk if you didn't get a party line. But along comes the one that you dial with your finger and this little thing is made so you don't have to use your finger. You put it on the end of a pencil, and you've always got that pencil right there with you, so you just dial it with this instead of your finger. I remember the first telephone that was in the neighborhood. She was a Mrs. Bozeman. She had, she was the only one that had a telephone in the neighborhood, and she would call, go to her front porch and call neighbors to come. If they, you could call, I could 
get a call up there. She would holler down there for me to come to the telephone on my mother, people across the street. Her daughter was one of the teachers at the Lutheran school. She was at Atheline Bradford. And uh, her mother was a Mrs. Bozeman. And uh, she was the only one in the neighborhood who had a telephone. It was one of those telephone, long telephones that you hung up the receiver onto the telephone. In the early days, firemen had to be at least 18 attend all fires and monthly meetings, parade once a month, and keep their equipment in good order. For this volunteer labor, the members were exempted from working on the streets and from paying street or poll taxes. One of those parades had to be cut short to respond to a fire at Woodstock Furnace No. 2. Then in 1914, they decided to, to make the fire department paid for the first time. and. Uh, uh, the volunteer chief, Daniel Cornelius Rainwater, um, he, he made the fire department what it is today. He might not be the father of the fire department, but he sure was the director. Roof fires is what they used to have a lot from flues, and it would, uh, those wooden shake uh, shingles, it would catch them on fire. So he uh, uh, put uh, some things in place that would keep that from happening. And Anniston, during that time, was known as a city that never burns. By 1914, West Anniston was protected by a new motorized fire truck the city had bought for $4,500. Old man Rainwater, Rainwater. And then uh, his son became uh, the fire chief. Uh, but old man Rainwater was Uncle Remus to us, and he would come down the street and sit down on the sidewalk and all the kids would get around him, and he'd tell us this story, and the bop bop get under them, and then he'd tell bop bop get him with a, he'd spit that snuff or whatever he had to back her up, and we kids would, and they won't laugh in his face, but he just kept right on talking and spitting that snuff or tobacco, I guess it was. But he looked just like Uncle Remus. I mean, you know, he just, just a good old, good old man. Everybody loved everybody then. You loved your people around you. You often hear folks today talking about knowing a guy. No doubt, Noble and Tyler knew many more than just a few. Tyler had extensive knowledge about the growing rail lines, both north and south of the Mason-Dixon line before the war. Then after the war, he moved south and began trying to rebuild what the Union armies had destroyed. It was Tyler who was the Anniston pitchman to the railroad companies, encouraging them to bring their lines through their new East Alabama town. Those trails of steel and cross ties were the lifelines of the growing community. Meantime, Noble was calling on his contacts, teasing them with his dreams like a fisherman using a lure to snag a big bass. Sam Noble had a lot of contacts. He brought people in from England. Uh, one was Simon Jewell, who was a stonemason, worked on several of the churches here in, in town. He knew a lot of people, and he could get them, you know, uh, I guess he paid them to come in and, and work in the foundries, be a stonemason, teach, and, and that sort of thing. Jewel and another stonemason named Coney Bear was credited with shaping and fitting every stone of the Church of St. Michael and All Angels, including those in the wall surrounding the church property. Jewel also supervised the construction of the St. Paul's Methodist Episcopal Church, Parker Memorial Baptist Church, Grace Episcopal Church, the foundation and basement of the Anniston Inn, and the Union train depot at West 13th Street and Walnut Avenue. Meantime, businessmen were setting up shop. Every store, just about every store when Anniston opened was owned by a Jewish merchant. Jakey Berman, the Ori store, Mr. Sachs's store, the Ullman store, um, the stores on the side, Jimmy Rosen's store, which was owned previously by the name, uh, uh, <laughs> owned by 
a guy named Sam Shower who used to take a nap in a coffin. I don't know if that's true. That's just a story that got around to me. The city was sending out representatives to pitch the model city at every available venue. The Woodstock Iron Company had a display at the Philadelphia Centennial Exhibition in 1876, the Piedmont Fair in Atlanta, and the New Orleans Grand Exposition in November 1885. In one display, they took a 40,000-pound piece of solid iron on a rail car and surrounded it with maps of Aniston. They also produced a booklet extolling the virtues of the city that was distributed widely to encourage people to come and invest in Aniston. The Noble Brothers also increased their iron holdings in 1880, and they created the Clifton Iron Company and bought the Alabama Furnace Company on Salt Creek just outside of Munford for $250,000. The community and furnace were renamed Jennifer in honor of Samuel Noble's mother. This meant the Nobles and Tylers and their 42,000 acres of land became the second largest producer of charcoal iron in the United States. The very next year, they branched out from iron and began operations at the Aniston Cotton Manufacturing Company, a huge operation that employed about 250 people, mostly women and girls, also paid by script, who were provided transportation to work. They also had a daycare center the workers could use while they processed almost all the cotton grown in the Aniston area and cranked out about five and a half million yards of fabric a year. All of this success caused the rest of the world to notice Aniston. It also took the title of county seat from Jacksonville in 1900 after a protracted court fight. When they built the Aniston Inn, people up north during the winter, we'd come down here to stay. Uh, Aniston Inn, I think we talked about, was 15th and Gurney up there. And um, the train station was off to the, if, if you're standing in front of the Aniston Inn, it was off to the right down there. And they would have horse-drawn buggy get the people, and they had a circular drive in front of the Aniston Inn, and they'd drop them off, and they would stay there, and they had meals there and all that kind of stuff. Uh, during the harsh winter months in the north, you know. Um, and there was, there was a lot out in front of the Aniston Inn, uh, recreational activity. There was a swimming pool and a basketball court. You could skate there and that kind of thing. So that's, people would come and, and stay at the Aniston Inn. The Aniston Inn caught fire in 1923, and all that is left today is the kitchen on the hill above Zen Park. Many hope it will be preserved. Uh, most of the cities, old cities that have come, come around, have done so by focusing on, on a quality of, you know, what you've got here. You've got a historic stuff. You want it to look historic. You don't want to change all the windows out. You want to change, you want to make it historic. And if you do that, then people will come here. But unfortunately, we've seen a lot of that not happen here. And, and that's, that's one of the reasons why they, the city created a downtown historic district, which allows us to you know, control what happens to some of the buildings, uh, which is a good thing. Uh, in fact, we just had Noble Cottage individually designated to keep, make sure that you know, when we sell it, whoever buys it doesn't, doesn't do something bad with it. Back in the early days, city leaders were concerned with controlling the workers and residents. One method was via prohibition, and those efforts only partially worked. Illegal liquor still found ways to seep into the model city. They had a vote prohibiting liquor, the, distrib the distribution, the giving away, any any way anybody could get liquor was forbidden. Forbidden, but not forgotten, bootleggers were rampant. In 1885, Aniston had a reputation for a lively, albeit illegal, whiskey trade. Sam Noble's son-in-law was quoted as saying he had never seen so much drunkenness as he saw in Aniston. He claimed in one month more than $7,000 in illegal whiskey was being smuggled into the town via the express office. That's the equivalent of almost a quarter million dollars in whiskey today. At the corner of 
17th and Noble, back about roughly 1890, I mean 1880, Anniston was incorporated. And the reason for the incorporation, the moonshiners were pretty heavy in that area and they needed city limits so they could control that. So the decision was made how they was going to do it and they set it down short a few a hundred feet of 17th and Noble and drew a circle a mile and a half and that was the city limits of Aniston all the way around a total circle of a mile and a half. And there is a, uh, a plug in the ground showing where the city limits began. Dad was a young kid. He, he began at age six or seven or eight to learn to sell. Uh, he would sell uh, matchbook box covers, calendars, all kinds of little things that a kid could buy and sell. And uh, he had a father that was a carpenter, uh, my Papa Evans. And uh, by the time Dad was about 10, the Depression was pretty strong, 1930, 32. And, they learned that they could make vanilla extract that had a little alcohol in it because we were on prohibition. And they could sell the vanilla extract. I still have a jug of it here. They would sell that to make a little money. And Dad used to say that they were pretty, pretty hard up. They would, were living in rental houses and would move from one house to another. George Kilby's grandfather was one of Aniston's early businessmen. Thomas Kilby also became governor of Alabama in 1919, proclaiming he wanted Alabama bone dry. Yeah, he was a big prohibitionist, although he drank. But his, yeah, he was he was not a uh, he was not a teetotaler, but he thought that that he wanted to get rid of what they call the bucket shops because he, he said that the the uh, workers would spend their money buying whiskey. And, and of course, he, he was like, I guess, a lot of people that prohibition would eliminate that, but it didn't, of course. And, uh, but, uh, and, but he was, he was uh, and, and uh, somebody said, yeah, well, he was a hypocrite. And I said, no, he wasn't a hypocrite. He, was, he had an honest belief that, uh, that the society would be better off without bars. And, uh, but he, he would uh, he would he would have his study every every night. After liquor sales were legalized in 1890, many saloons and bars opened in Anniston, including the Peerless Saloon on 10th Street. The Peerless is now considered Alabama's oldest operating bar and sits on the National Register of Historic Places. But Aniston's trouble with liquor was not finished by a long shot. When the temperance movement heated up two decades later, resulting in the passing of the 18th Amendment outlawing alcohol, a lawless segment of society became more vicious. Starting in May 1914, six Aniston policemen were murdered in just 10 months. My grandfather got shot in, in Aniston. He was taking a prisoner from the jail over to the courthouse or something, and somebody come by and shot him. He was Andrew Jackson Holland. There's been so many stories that I, I don't know what's true and what's not. They said that he was killed down at Constantine Homes when he went down there to check on a brothel house and he got killed down there. And some say that he got killed at, at, around the police station and all. I, I don't know what happened, really. On December 21, 1914, 
The Aniston Star reported police officer Jack Holland was shot and killed after he responded to a call for help on Glen Addy Avenue. A drunk federal prohibition agent, Burkett Evans, had been patronizing the known brothel and Holland arrested him. When they got out on the street, one of Evans's friends emerged from a home and opened fire. During the shootout, Holland and his prisoner were both shot. Holland died the next day. Three men were tried for the killing. Brothels and speakeasies, commonly called blind tigers back in the day, were scattered all over Aniston and were often run by ruthless individuals. His name was Harry Shretsky. Well, Harry was the terror of the blind tigers because he was trying to shut down all the bootleggers. So uh, the, the folks on the west side of Anniston wrote the mayor a letter and they said, it's just terrible over here, it's terrible. It's bootleggers, you know, wild and woolly and whatever. So they sent Harry, young Harry, over to one of the houses where the moonshiner was and they opened the door and the moonshiner put a derringer right to his stomach and shot him. Another moonshiner picked him up, took him to the hospital. He died. He became a martyr. He became the reason that Aniston had to clean itself up. Aniston continued to flourish. Good planning and easy access to the railroads helped Aniston become the fifth largest city in the state during the first half of the 20th century. When I came from Gazin over here in 1940, 39, I came from Gazin to Aniston, and that's when we had the soldiers and the National Guard, and then all of the war came, and all of the came to Aniston, the troops and everything. And so that, I was just a young girl then. I had just finished business college, and I came to Aniston, and that's when all of the things were here. And that's when Aniston was hustling. I mean, we had Noble Street was so big. Every store was occupied. We had businesses everywhere. Aniston was at its height right then. There were stores downtown like uh, Silver's that was between 11th and 10th Street, and uh, we shopped there when I was a child. And then there was W.T. Grant's and S.H. Cress's, and uh, that's where we shopped for most of our groceries. And um, then uh, for dress well, there was a store, uh, Mangles, and that was another store, Woolworth. That's where we shopped on Nova Street. And when I was going to school, I used to work after school. I would walk from Cobb School to downtown to uh, Mangles. That's where I worked for a while before I finished high school. I went in in the afternoon and helped clean up, and we uh, put out uh, garments and straighten up the shelves and things like that. And before then, I worked at Max Barbecue. It was on 15th Street, and Jeff Barbecue was on 15th Street. Jeff Barbecue stand was between Brown and McDaniel on 15th Street. Max Barbecue stand was between Brown and Stevens on 15th Street. And people would come from far and near for the barbecue. I just loved walking up and down Noble Street and looking in the windows. But then, as I got older, oh, to go to Anniston and walk up and down the street and look in the dress shops and the shoe shops and uh, see all of the, to me, they were just beautiful clothes because my mother sewed all of my clothes. They were nice, but. They, they weren't store-bought. There was just something special about store-bought clothes. And the hat shops. Oh, I love the hat shops. The three dime stores were Cress's and Grant's and F.W. Woolworth. One of them between 10th and 11th and the other two between 11th and 12th. And uh, there was a drugstore 
Scarborough's drugstore on the east side of of, um, of Noble Street between 11th and 12th, which was a meeting of all the kids after school. That uh, and when I was home for vacation, I'd go down there and meet with the folks I'd gone to school with for several years. And uh, they had a lunch counter and a little booth where you could get a Coke or a BLT or a hamburger or whatever. And that attracted, and it was right next door to the smokehouse. And I remember there being a fire. The smokehouse was a pool hall, and it was the oldest going business on Noble Street to never have moved its, uh, its location. And they had the best chili in town. And uh, this drugstore was right next door to the pool hall. And, uh, oh, anyway, we used to go down there a lot. And uh, uh, next door to that was Coleman's Dress Shop, and across the street was uh, another dress shop, uh, Diamond Jewelry Company, it was between 10th and, and uh, 11th, uh, across from Silver's, which was another dime store, uh, Weichel's was down there between 10th and 11th. And uh, those were kind of gathering places for teenagers. Many have fond memories of the circus coming to Anniston. Yes, I remember Ringland Brothers Circus used to come here once a year. And they would set up um, the tents down here where the um, Anderson Star used to be. And that was close to the railroad tracks and the, all the, uh, the animals and other uh, clowns and so forth would come in on those trains. And when they came in, they would park those trains down there and they'd, the first thing they'd do is take, get the elephants off. And the elephants would help them unload and carry the loads to the place where they were going to put up the tents or whatever was going inside the tents. It was a three-ring circus. Had a lot of trapeze, a lot of clowns. It seemed to me like there were a lot of lions, but <laughs> looking back on it, I wonder if there really were. Um, cotton candy. And they always uh, set up a tent down where the Anderson Star used to be down on 10th Street, and we could always go to the circus downtown. And that was every year. And I've seen them have parades with elephants and all coming down Noble Street. Mm -hmm. I was terrified of the clowns. Didn't like the clowns. <laughs> I sit right under mother. <laughs> oh, and uh, the ladies that, uh, you remember the ones that uh, they would be outside the ring, but they were on the rope, and they wore fishnet hose. I, I had a fit to have some of those hose. I thought that, and that's what I wanted to be when I grew up. Was one of those girls on the ring uh, was on a rope, and they would go up and do tricks. Do y'all remember that? I remember every year we we would get to go to the mother would take me to the circus, and then I in turn took my children to the circus, and. He, uh, of course, I didn't take my grand granddaughter because she was terrified of clowns too. <laughs> but uh, we used to go every year. I had forgotten about that. And the fair, the county fair that we used to have, that used to be a big thing in Anniston too, with the, all the rides and uh, going to see the livestock and everybody's food stuff that they had put up, you know. In the Korean War, we bought the. Uh, pipe plant that was um, where um, it's there, where FMC, well, it's now um, United, I don't know what it is now, but anyway, that uh, that plant was a, was a Woodstock iron plant, I think, and in, in the 50s when we bought it, the Ringling Brothers Circus uh, had, was using it for their winter uh, quarters for their a animals. They were they had elephants and tigers and giraffes and stuff walking around all in there. 
There were lots of shops and theaters on Noble and elsewhere. Oh, Lord, yes. Three movie theaters and then Aston four at one point. There was the Ritz, which was on uh, 12, 13th and Noble. The Calhoun was between 11th and 12th. Um, and then the Cameo was between 10th and 11th, which was a kind of a, we used to call it a, a, a three sticker. You, you, you use one stick to prop up your, your chair. You use a second stick to beat the rats away that would come there and, and sign the shit. I mean, it, it wasn't that bad, but it was, that was it. And then it became, it became after I was back here in Aniston, it became where the little theater put on their productions. And then there was the Noble Theater, which was on the corner of 10th and, and uh, Noble. And it showed all the double feature westerns and all stuff like that. And uh, used to be a, a, the Calhoun between 11th and 12th. Um, Anyhow, they showed the regular movies, and then Rich did too. And then you had you had three drive-ins: the Midway, the Skyway, and the Bama, um, which people used to pile six people in the trunk and drive in, buy one ticket, then let them all out. And then I remember our first permanent, and they hooked me up to them my wires, and I said, "Lord, if this place catches on fire, I'm gonna go and get out of here with all them things from the ceiling hooked on Melula's Beauty Shop." was there on Noble Street and she gave me a, my first permanent and, and from then on, because I had straight hair, bangs, you <laughs> see, and, uh, but I got that permanent and I thought I was, whoo, rich. I tell you, I thought my mama stuck it rich somewhere. <laughs> it was a store named Jitney Jungles. And that's where everybody was buying their groceries in the jungles. And then uh, if you wanted clothing, they had, oh, Anderson had, Anderson was so lively then, Noble Street. It had, uh, if you wore very, very good clothes, they had Coleman's. They had, and for men, they had United, United Woolens. And then uh, we had Gales and Burmans down uh, on Noble Street, um, they had, uh, I mean, if you wanted good, Dobson's had the junky clothes, and if you, anything you wanted is on Noble Street. Now, um, the five and dime stores that we had was Silver's, Grant's, Woolsworth, and those were the ones who had the uh, counters where you could, uh, where food was served but of course, we couldn't be served. Uh, it's the kind of the stores that all had colored water and white water, colored restrooms. And some of them didn't have colored restrooms. So we would ride the train from Chakalaka to Anderson sometimes. We could ride the train for 25 cents. And it was not Fourth, not Fourth Street Station. It was where the pub is now. That was the station that was used. And I think that's down on what, about Gurney Avenue, somewhere down over that way anyway. The Peerless was, had an upstairs and, and they had some ladies of the evening that hung out up there and did their business. And in front of them is Western Auto now, but at one point that was one of Sachs' stores. Well, anyway, the men didn't want people to see them. So there was a way that you could go up the back door of the store and go across the catwalk and get into where that was. But the greatest part of the story was told to me by Hank Sachs, who was the greatest storyteller ever known to man. His parents owned a very fine men's clothing store. They sold like Hart Shafter and Marks, I mean, high line stuff. And the, the lady who managed the body house used to come in at Christmas and buy, you know, ties, shirts, 
for her customers. And after Christmas, Mrs. Sachs used to look to see who was wearing those ties. And not all of the attractions downtown were above ground, even on a cold January night. We were spending the night with Mike in the building where Bill Ward has that insurance, uh, his insurance office on 14th and Quintard. Well, that was where the Jennings lived, where Mike's family lived. We sneaked out side window and got down to the ground and left and we were in our pajamas and barefoot and we went to Snow Creek. You know, it runs under the city. We got in the creek and went under Aniston with one flashlight and came up Hobo Jungle in Glen Eddy and walked back across town, dodging anybody that we saw. And when we got back into the heart, right around where the post office is now, okay, some police saw us, a police car. So we took off different directions. And we got, I guess, in some bushes somewhere, but we could see where the police centered on Goob, on Sean. And they chased him around the post office twice. And he finally ran out of gas and they caught him. <laughs> and so we worked our way back up to 14th to Mike's house and uh, got back in, but uh, it was too late. They'd already taken Goob there, woke his parents up, and, and uh, we were nailed. It was later discovered that Snow Creek was one of the local waterways polluted with PCBs by the local Monsanto plant, creating a huge health hazard that wasn't discovered for decades. In the early 50s, many in the Anniston area also felt the scare of the polio epidemic. The disease had been crippling and killing people for several years, especially children. It was enough to cause many to avoid crowds and public events. Not long after the war was over, we had a terrible uh, epidemic of polio, infantile paralysis, here in Anniston. And there was no prevention of it. There was no uh, treatment much. And if you had a really bad case, I can remember some young people being in iron lungs there was a most horrible looking tank that helped the, them to breathe. And uh, thankfully, the Salk vaccine was invented. The Y was built in 1952, which is the year that I came. Uh, Mother said that was a really difficult year, to, especially since we moved in the summertime, because there was a polio epidemic going on at that time. And of course, summertime was the worst time for it. And they closed all the pools and they closed all the movie theaters, you know, picture shows. And even churches were, some of the churches were closed. Now, it wasn't as big a deal as COVID, but it really was because it affected children most of the time. Yes, it was bad. I, I know several people who had polio, um, particularly athletes. There was one particular one, it was Buddy Rutledge. I don't know whether you recognize that name or not, but he was a local here and he went to the University of Georgia on a football scholarship. And he had polio as a, and he was confined to a wheelchair for the rest of his life. And he died early and I'm, it was probably because of that. But there were several other people. I know at Auburn there was a, a student Bill Tucker, who was a, the quarterback on the football team, and he developed polio, and he, he was confined to a wheelchair the rest of his life, too. School could mean more than just classrooms and homework for some youngsters. Occasionally, it became a time for missed opportunities. When I was a senior, we were in geometry class up on the second level at the old Anniston High School, and... Uh, Mac Dunaway had transferred in the year before. His family had been in the military and his father was off 
as I understand it. His, his mother lived here with Mac, and it turned out he had a sister uh, that went to Florida State. And she was coming home for the weekend, and he was trying to get her a date. She wanted to go out on a date. Well, Mac was our second string quarterback. And uh, Mac was uh, hail fellow well met, but had sort of a bulldog looking face. And if you looked at Mac and says, do I want to date his sister? <laughs> uh, the answer was no. <laughs> and uh, uh, I turned him down. I was not the only one. He asked about five or six folks. Uh, if they would date his sister that weekend. And to my knowledge, she did not have a date that weekend. And it turned out to be Faye Dunaway. But others seized opportunities presented to them as they went to school and often worked to assist their families. I enjoyed Aniston because in my letter, days in school at Hobson City, I was able to drive a school bus, which was a blessing. Uh, I could make my own money, have some spending change, as well as put some in the house. And I also, I worked at the regional medical center after school. Uh, when I wasn't driving the bus. And sometime I had a friend that we would alternate. He would drive the bus home, and I would go on to work. And surprising, my first job at regional was 33 and 30 cents an hour. That was big money because you made a dollar a day. They wouldn't let us work but three hours. But now on the weekend, they would let us work 12 hours. <laughs> so that 12 plus that 33 and 30 cents per hour, it made up. So you would almost have $20, pretty close to $20. And how old was he driving the school bus? 16. Now don't, don't ask me how many times I drove without driving license. Do they make come get me? and put me in jail. <laughs> when I first started driving the school bus, uh, I was less than 16. The guy ahead of me was uh, a year older than me. So when he came down, uh, I had already been helping him. So I just moved right on in the slot. For some, school was nearby and so was a place to play, like Zen Park or the local pool. Six Ward School, it was across the alley from where I lived, and the school was across the alley from, the, from the, my house. And I could wait and leave about ten minutes before the bell rung before I had to be there. A lot of times we went over to the school and played on the school ground, and uh, I skated and we went skating around the schoolyard and all, and I went down to uh, Zen Park. It was about two or three blocks down on the right-hand side, and then we went down there and skated too. In the 1940s and 50s, pipe shops were still running full bore, helping Anniston maintain its moniker, Soil Pipe Capital of the World. Many men worked there, and so did some teenagers. Calhoun County Training School, which you, you might say was Houston City High School, but it was Calhoun County Training School. It was called that because the students there were not viewed as people interested in going to college, but we were going to go to pick cotton. And so we could leave school at 1 o'clock and catch the bus to go pick cotton. And I must admit, I cheated a little bit. I said I was going to pick cotton when I was going to work at the Anderson Foundry. After I got to be like ninth and 10th grade. Uh, but, but yeah, it was the, the priority was for the black students to get out of school and go pick cotton. 
You know what shake out, shaking out is? Where they, they pour this hot iron, it's like running water, they pour the iron, and then you mold the iron into what we call fittings or pipes. So that, that, that was, my job was to shake out the fittings. My dad prepared the sand. He was really high level because he was able to take care of the sand. The advent of PVC pipe was the death knell of Aniston's soil pipe industry. Unless a foundry could pivot to a new product, there was a dwindling market for cast iron pipes. That was just one of many changes Aniston would face in the coming years. Quintard, now the main roadway through downtown Aniston at one time, only ran from 22nd Street near Blue Mountain to 5th Street where L.G. Jones lived. He built a home at 500 Quintard, which was right at 5th Street where Quintard ended when, uh, um, you know, it was back before the, the 60s, you know, when, the, when it was extended. But it was a beautiful old home there. And, uh, but it, was, it faced 5th Street, but it faced uh, right down uh, Quintard, uh, or north on Quintard, and um, you could see all the beautiful houses down there and uh, um, the steeple of Parker Memorial Church and all that was uh, right in front of it. <clears throat> but he wanted the Quintard address. And um, he kept on with the city. They said, no, you're on Fifth Street. And that You've got to have a Fifth Street address. He said, no, I'm not. It, this is Quintard. <laughs> I'm on a 500 Quintard. He won. <laughs> Oh, it was, it's a tremendous change. When I grew up, uh, <clears throat> I visited Anniston because I had aunts who lived here. And as I was saying before to her, uh, my aunt and I would go downtown and all the stores were on Noble Street, homes, all up and down Quintard, Wilbur, were homes. And uh, a lot of very beautiful homes on Quintard. It was not a two-lane road. It was always had a median down the, with the trees in it. But there was a single lane of traffic on either side rather than a, a double lane. And it says when you would get 22nd Street, you had to take a left and go back to Noble Street and then take another right and go to Jacksonville or Piedmont. And of course, if you were going south and wanted to go to Oxford, when you got to Fifth Street, well, I don't think Fifth Street went in, so I guess you'd have to maybe turn on Sixth Street and get down to uh, Noble Street that way and go to Oxford. That's where the streetcar went. And the streetcar came up Seventh Street, and it, I could stand on my front porch and see it go up 7th Street. I can remember the first fast food restaurant was there. It was the Jacks up on Noble Street. I mean, on Quintard now it was the first fast food restaurant. As a matter of fact, we had just been married a few months, um, maybe a year, when they started widening it, and we lived through that. And a lot of beautiful, beautiful homes were torn down, you know, to make the street a divided street, but it's still pretty, and um, and we still have some beautiful streets in Anniston with some beautiful homes still, still existing, that are beautiful. But it was it was messy. I remember that when it rained, it was just just nothing but mud. Some downtown businesses created vivid memories that linger today like Lloyd's Bakery, owned by E.C. Lloyd, who eventually became mayor. But he would say, if you bring so many breads, bread wrappers back, and I'll give, you know, you, you get a, a pass for the movie, or it was just things like that that he was always doing. I think he was a very nice man. Uh, I didn't know him personally. It was Lloyd's Bakery. It turned into Hart's Bakery later. And Mr. E.C. Lloyd was a mayor of Anniston. And children got to get in free at the theater if they brought three uh, bread wrappers. 
and of course we kept bread wrappers constantly, so my sister and I got in free every Saturday. And E.C. Lloyd um, gave away bicycles and skates and all kinds of things for, for children, but I was never lucky. <laughs> I never won anything. <laughs> he loved children. He really did. He did a lot for, for, for Aniston and for the children. Because, you know, we had Tom Mix and Gene Autry and uh, Flash Gordon, that was big, and, and uh, um, Hopalong Cassidy, and, and then, you know, it was Saturday morning to movies. And we'd just ride our bikes down there, or, <clears throat> or if we felt really adventurous, you could walk uh, down the um, drain, drains that are, you know, like, like the, um, well, uh, over near, um, um, well, where Hamilton Park is, there was one of them there, the ditch. It was all done CCC work, and it was that stone and, and concrete, <clears throat> but it was that way all the way into town, and we could walk under underneath part of the downtown to get to the movies. It was an adventure, you know. Mr. Lloyd had a break, break, uh, bakery between 13th and 12th Street, I believe. And uh, he would have matinees on Saturday, and you used the bread, bread crack uh, wrappers to go to the theaters. Mm -hmm. And I remember the Calhoun Theater. There's a ditch there now where the Calhoun Theater is on Nova Street, I believe. There's a, a club there. And uh, we had to go in from the side door. You could go in from Nova, but you went in from the side door. The whites went in from the front. And, uh, we went upstairs there. I remember we went down, I went down there on Saturday morning and my father took me down there and well, I was going to meet several other people who were all going to the movie and so, and we didn't have any Lloyd's bread, Lloyd's bread wrappers. And so my father said, well, I'll take him down there and I'll just pay it, 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 whatever it is to, you know, 50 cents or 25 cents or whatever. Well, they wouldn't let me in without the bread wrappers, even if I paid money, if my father paid money. And so he said, uh, well, look, let me just leave him here. If you don't mind him going in there and getting with his pals, I'll go get the bread wrappers right now. And he went to the grocery store, bought two loaves of Lloyd's bread, and came in there and showed that he'd bought them, but he at least gave them to me, and I got to bring them home that day. Now, I do remember that. But I was embarrassed as hell when he came in there at the, when we were sitting with all the kids and he had two loaves of Lloyd bread. And <laughs> he said, this is what I had to get to get you in here. Oh, I do remember that. Uh, but they were serious about it. They wanted you to buy that Lloyd's bread. There was one summer, or maybe two, that uh, Daddy would say, well, you get into the movie for free with three bird wrappers or something like this, you know. And I would stand there and I'd play like I was counting, you know, I wasn't counting any bird wrappers, you know, they'd hand it. I'd say, oh, great, great, you're going to love the movie, you know. Maybe that was for like a couple of summers or something like that, you know. But that was good advertising, you know. They literally didn't want you taking your Lloyd's bread wrapper home with you and bringing it back next Saturday to get in for free. So you would have to hand them out when you got in the theater, and they would literally took them out back on, on the 13th and halfway down to uh, Wilmer. Gurney, I, I'm embarrassed to tell you, I can't remember which, is, which side of Noble Street, Wilmer and Gurney, but anyway, I guess it's Gurney. And they put them in a metal can and started burning them up. Well, the smoke came into the Ritz Theater, and the People decided the theater was on fire, so they stopped the movie. And you've got to get out. You've got to get out. The theater was burning. Well, it had nothing to do with the theater burning down. It was just the smoke from the Lloyd's bread wrapper had gotten into the <laughs> into the thing. Another popular Anastonian was Doc Caffey, Dr. Benjamin Franklin Caffey Sr. He and his son, Dr. Frank Caffey Jr., were some of the first faces seen by many babies born in the area. I think Doc delivered, he was in practice for 53 years, and I bet he delivered minimal of 100 babies, 
So you do that math. <laughs> Doc, my, grand, my father only practiced for 13 years. So I don't know and how many babies he delivered. My grandfather probably delivered 100 babies a year. He probably delivered thousands of babies. I think it would be pretty safe to say. And uh, I, my father didn't come anywhere close. But when mom, and doc, and daddy died, um, they dedicated the maternity ward to them <laughs> at Aniston Memorial Hospital. <laughs> they gave a birthday party for my fa grandfather when he was 70. They let the schools out. They had it at the, in the football field and stadium, you know, which was not big in those days. And um, they asked everybody that Dr. Kathy had, uh, you know, birthed, um, was their doctor, to stand up. And half the stadium stood up. Doc delivered babies all the time. <laughs> and he was noted for having the first baby of the year, and some of his colleagues teased him a lot, a lot about that. Like, what are you doing to hold it back? So she goes, just make it that, you know. Anyway, but Doc, and he knew all of his babies. He had a black book, and he wrote his babies down. In my childhood, we were not able to go to the library. It was not offered to us. But I had, we used to have a lot of books and all. The Catholics, our doctors that lived over there, uh, my mother worked for them in the kitchen, and she provided us with lots of books, and my mama would buy books. We had, they had secondhand stores, so stores with used books, a lot of used books, because parents would have to buy some of their textbooks from the used stores. Georgia grew up to be a school teacher. I graduated from Alexandria High School in 1937, and I was the first lady to go to work in the Calhoun County Sheriff's Office, and I went to work in that in January of 39, and it was, of course, a uh, I, I could not type. They did not type. She shopping at the high school theater. And Mr. Little was principal. And he set up a typewriter for me in his office so I could learn what typing I needed to do. In the sheriff's office. He was a great principal. In between 1937 and 1939, I worked in a county farm office. That's where they had a uh, where the Depression came again. There was a plane flew over and made pictures of the cotton field because the farmers were limited on how much cotton they could grow. And they made pictures. And I worked in that office with a little machine measuring the cognitive show to be sure that they were not overdoing it. Aniston has had a start and stop relationship with the military since its early years. First, Camp Ship was established in 1898 on the northwest side of town to mobilize troops for the Spanish-American War. That was only for a few months, and afterward, a temporary hospital was set up there to treat military patients during the flu epidemic. In 1912, about 20,000 National Guardsmen moved in for maneuvers and artillery practice in the Chakalaka Mountains. 
That prompted the federal government in 1917 to buy about 19,000 acres that became Camp McClellan to train men for World War I. After the war, Camp McClellan was nearly empty in caretaker status until it was renamed Fort McClellan and declared a permanent installation in 1929. During the Depression in the next decade, the Works Progress Administration brought in workers erecting buildings and other structures to provide jobs. In October 1940, the fort was expanded to gear up for World War II. Everybody had a job during the war and that you volunteered for. My father was a air raid warden. My mother was in something called the Motor Corps. I think most of these were to be ready in case the United States was bombed. And then there would be more need for these. But they, they had plenty to do. And uh, I was a Girl Scout during that time, and I went to, I remember going to the post office downtown. My Girl Scout troop uh, went down to that post office, and we wrapped Christmas presents for the soldiers at Fort McClellan for them to send home for Christmas. I can remember doing that now. I think that's where I really learned. I have no telling what those packages looked like, but they appreciated them so much. The Red Cross Motor Corps was established in 1918 to transport the sick and wounded from troop trains to local hospitals and to do other jobs. During World War II, 45,000 women enrolled in the Motor Corps. While the soldiers were off in Europe and the Pacific fighting the war, at home in Anniston their families were making sacrifices to support them. Rationing was in effect. Oh, I can remember the stamp books. You could not get, but so many, I think a couple of pair of shoes a year, and you had stamps for that, and stamps for a lot of things that you, sugar and just things that were rationed, they called at that time. But we had a place over in West Anniston that every now and then, see we were a manufacturing town, and every now and then, of course, you had to know when, but they would have hoes and things, and ladies would go over there and wait for them to open up and buy hoes. I did it with food, most of our food, but I also did a ration book that you were limited on things you could buy. It's actually I have one of my rations. It was not easy, that's how. But we made it. If you were a ration, I would say you could get it. If sugar was a ration, gas, for people that have. Uh, was right. Yes, there were several things of ration. You had to have that cheek, the sound when you bought something. But for people that did not use the other life, she said. They would give up to somebody else to be. It was a hard time, and yet it was a good time in a city. People shared. So it was with people. Hey, yeah, they worked everything with oil. But one time, I was over 16, of course, 
My mother told me I could take the car to school. I was so thrilled. I couldn't believe that I was going to get to drive that car. So I took it to school. And then afterwards, when I got home, mother said, well, how was it? I said, school? No, no. She said, I'm talking about the car. And I got this look on my face. She said, what's happened? I said, I forgot it. I left it down there at the school. <laughs> I mean, that was such a big thing to be able, as a 16-year-old, to have a car. And then you go walk off and leave it. <laughs> I was used to walking home from school, high school. That's exactly what I did. <laughs> Um, and of course, food was rationed, you know, every, everything in this town was, was like all over America. You had meat rationing, you had gas rationing, you, you know, you weren't free to buy just anything. Clothes, I can't remember buying a whole bunch of clothes. During the war, Fort McClellan became a detention camp too. I never was in any contact. I know we had them out there. And we had them, and then we had their own little cemetery. We had Japanese out there who had to live out there. You know, we had a unit of Japanese people out here at the fort. And it was families, Japanese families, who lived here in the United States. But they had to go and live out there. They were consigned to live out there. And we had a unit at Fort McClellan for the Japanese families. The now infamous Japanese internment camp set up after the Pearl Harbor attack housed 120,000 Japanese Americans gathered from around the country. Any brought to McClellan were only there for a short while. When the POW camps in Europe were filled, Fort McClellan set up a prison camp to hold about 3,500 prisoners, mostly Germans, captured in North Africa. The camp opened in uh, July of 1943. Yes, that's correct. Um, and coming in with that uh, was the first train load of German soldiers. Now I have a, uh, in, in, my, in my files, in my docs, I have a letter, a memoir, if you will, from a former POW that wrote it after he came back. And he reiterated what I had just said about how he could not believe um, how still we had so much and we're so lucky and so fortunate. We weren't starving. We weren't living in huts and hovels. The prisoners in the South all came from uh, the North African campaign, you know, Rommel's men. All of a sudden, you know, we had 100,000 captured troops, both Italian and Germans, there in Tunisia and in the, uh, in the desert. So we were, knew that we were going to make the push to Germany, but we had all these prisoners that we had to take care of. So what we did with them is then we sent them out of country to Great Britain, and then they were put on ships and sent to New York, and then put on trains and brought to the south. Fort McClellan was the processing center for all 24 main POW camps scattered around Alabama. Some, like Camp Aliceville in Pickens County, were designated segregation camps where the hardcore Nazi true believers were separated from the rest of the prisoners because they were known to terrorize and even kill others for being friendly with their American captors. Ten of Hitler's SS troops were held at Camp Seibert, a segregation camp in Etowah County. The guys at Fort McClellan were also allowed to work off post. The prisoners were often used to augment the, uh, the workforce in the local community. They could work on, for instance, a local farm, and they would be paid 80 cents a day. And that money they could keep, or in fact, they could even have that money sent home to Germany to their families, which of course the United States did. One of the prisoners died when a truck turned over while they were working on a road through Baines Gap. He was buried on McClellan, along with other German and Italian prisoners, just up the hill from the POW camp. Now, the cemetery at Fort McClellan has 26 Germans and three Italians buried there. Only four that are buried there were actually uh, prisoners of war at, at McClellan. All the others were brought and reburied there. They had all died in other camps throughout the South and were brought to Fort McClellan because Fort McClellan was sort of, quote, temp uh, the permanent final resting place. When the war ended, remnants of the POW's stay at McClellan lingered 
stone walls, chimneys, a patio built behind the old recreation center, and some very colorful reminders still exist at Remington Hall, the former officers' club. Yeah. Well, being what they call an army brat, I lived on a lot, quite a few posts. <laughs> but this one was very nice. It was, the quarters were new, that beautiful officers' club out there, which is in such bad shape now. With them on the price. In fact, you know, we during the war we had German prisoners out of Fort McLaren, and I used to go, walk down and watch them painting those paintings in the in the bar there, doing those murals that they had done. Years later, the Aniston Star talked to the former club manager, who said it was fascinating to watch three German painters create the murals. After World War II, Fort McClellan was again mothballed until it was needed for the Korean conflict in 1950. After Korea cooled, several training operations were moved to McClellan, including some secret projects involving chemical weapons. Had the chemical school out there, the MPs. Um, a lot of people went through Fort McClellan to Vietnam, sure did. The Army eventually stored about 7% of the nation's chemical weapons at the Anniston Army Depot until they began leaking and were eventually all incinerated at the disposal plant ending in 2013. When my granddaddy died, grandmother came to live with us. And for entertainment for her, her sons were in the military. So my daddy, we were blessed and fortunate enough in there to have a car mo all the time. And he would take her down to Noble Street and all the soldiers from Fort McClellan on the weekend would come to Anniston, but they had to walk. And they would wander up and down the streets and maybe go to movies or what have you. She was felt so comfortable with them with her sons in the military and hoping that they were having a good time. Then in 1999, the Defense Department bid adieu to McClellan again. The Anniston Army Depot remains. The connection between Anniston and the military was not just Fort McClellan. After Kilby Steel became FMC, George Kilby and Bill Bryant came to the Army's aid. The M1 tank had a really bad track on it, and um, we had talked about this for a lot of years, and, and uh, the Army said they wanted somebody to design a uh, new track. Well, we, did, we, did, we just copied another design, actually, but Bill was a super uh, welder and, and uh, stuff, and so when the, the division manager told us that, and so I said, Bill, go out there and take a, this track and cut it up and put it back together and make what they want. And that's the track that's on the M1 tank now. It was developed right here. And Aniston came to the aid of taxicab companies around the world, trying to manage what cab drivers were charging customers and what they turned over to the cab companies. So one of the managers at the taxi company, a guy named Press Adams, who was a great guy, he lived out in Alexandria, very smart. He said, you know, there's got to be a better way to do this than the way we're doing it. So uh, he had some smart people that worked for him, and they decided that they would build what's called a cab meter. The cab, when you got in the cab, you would have a flag and you'd pull it down and the meter would start running. And the company called, was called Cabometer, pronounced as Cabometer. And Cabometer was built here in Anniston and stayed here for a long time, till the 60s probably. And they literally operated all over the world. Not literally all over the world, but in Europe and all over North America. So no community exists without ugly edges tarnishing its history. Those intense, painful memories are sometimes created by individuals and others by angry mobs. Whatever the cause, the effects haunt a community and unfortunately can influence the perceptions outsiders hold of a region. 
three or four of us walking home from Camel Field after a baseball game. And on Pine, we turned the corner there at the, at the uh, 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 fire station. And it's the first house right there. And they're in there gambling. And I almost said his name. Big guy who lived the third house up, lived there all his life, came out, waved us, went, came back out, went in, and he, what is he doing? Walked in, and that guy, there were three of them sitting in the room, and this one guy, boom, six times. Chair, nailed him to the wall. And we're standing there watching it. And he, the shooter, came back out. We got boys go home. Went, packed up, I guess. Was gone. They never called him. They never called him for that crime. Thought, that guy is dead as a doornail. He didn't even die. He shot him six times. He didn't die. That's probably the worst act of violence I saw growing up there, okay? I mean, other, other than that, it was like, you know, fist fights between young guys, that's all. That was bad news. The first really bad criminal activity that I remember, and uh, this happened over in, in out in the country at White Plains, and there was a lady that chopped up and dismembered two men and distributed their body parts all over the countryside. Viola Virginia Hyatt was dubbed the Alabama Axe Murderess and the Torso Slayer after she confessed to killing Emmett and Lee Harper in 1959. She shot them with a shotgun, dismembered their bodies, and scattered their body parts across multiple northeast Alabama counties. And like I said, he kept the name of all of his babies, and he knew, he, my sister Jane was asking him one day, we were out in the house, we went over there a lot of times for Sunday dinner, and Doc uh, said, well, my babies didn't do too well. He said, I said, what? And he said, well, Viola got caught. <laughs> Viola, the hatchet murderess. <laughs> and my sister Jane went, Doc, you didn't deliver her. He said, well, yeah, I did. You should have left her. <laughs> Then, on July 15th, 1965. I was working at the radio station that summer night, and uh, we would go off the air at 11 o'clock. Several of my buddies would gather and be there as I would go off the air, and then we would, we would go out. And uh, there was a white man's revival almost that was going on uh, at the courthouse and we would walk down the alley from 14th behind the radio building all the way down to 12th and you come up and you're right by the side of the courthouse and uh, the so-called Reverend Connie Lynch was the speaker and he had loud loud PA system set up, and uh, he, I remember these words distinctly, he, and this was been about 11.30, 11.45 at night, he said, let the streets of Anniston run red within blood. And that always stuck with me. And that night then, as a uh, uh, the gentleman left work after his second shift job in the foundry, was heading home. Several of these folks that heard those words and were there uh, shot him, drove up behind him and, and shot him and killed him. And uh, made national headlines, of course. Out of that ultimately developed the uh, cool, you know, decided we've got to talk to each other and know what's going on. And they developed the Council of Unified Leadership called COOL, which carried on for another 15 years or, 
or so. But I'll never forget hearing those words as they echoed really uh, through the streets right in front of the courthouse about between 11.30 and midnight that night. Willie Brewster Sr. was shot in the neck while driving home to Munford with three co-workers. They'd left the Union Foundry in Anniston after finishing the late shift. He died four days later. Three men were arrested. One was convicted of second-degree murder, but he was killed in a barroom brawl while out on bond. The other two went free. But I do remember one night, um, my dad turned the light with, with the house was dark and he let us stand at the door and the Ku Klux marched down Wilmer where, where I live they went down uh, to it was, they were just walked in front of the house and I saw them in their white coats and the hoods and you could hear their feet shuffling I do remember that sound of the shuffle of feet but no voices and it was about two blocks down the next morning there was a cross burned in front of a house and uh, when I asked mom and dad about it that my dad said that was a house of ill repute it was everything was based on white and black so we had a lot of stories about the clans and then they used to tell me you know I said well how y'all know who they are with all this uniform on this and that Say so all you had to do was look them in the eyes and look at the shoes. You say the same shoes, people don't, uh, back during the day, they didn't change shoes like we do now. You say a lot of business owners, they was in the class. You say, with the hood on, you can tell. Look at them shoes and look at them eyes. Them eyes ain't gonna change. It was violence and hate-filled segregationists that thrust Aniston back into the national spotlight in 1961 when a mob firebombed a Freedom Riders bus during the Civil Rights Movement. Some other incidents were a bit more subtle, but still quite damaging. Well, it was a mixed picture. I mean, I, I tell the story of um, when I first went to, we passed the Rexall, I guess it was, old like drugstore, and uh, when I first went there, I was five years old, and I had finally convinced my parents to let me go to the movie with my brothers. So I went there, and I slipped away from them because I was going to buy, I would saved my money, I was going to buy a five-cent ice cream cone. So I went up to them, and, and that's when I first heard such terms as, we don't serve Negroes in here. They didn't say that word that way, but... I'm five years old, I, and I just went in there to get well, So that was sort of the beginning of understanding that there was a challenge facing me throughout my life, and that was just an example of it. But I, I mean, I, I had an opportunity as a student at Morehouse and as a medical student to fight back. Uh, and I guess for me, the opportunity to fight back was, you know, getting away from my parents so that they wouldn't necessarily get hurt because of what I did or said. I taught kindergarten at my church, and then I went. They called and wanted to know if I'd come with the public kindergarten, the first public kindergarten. And I taught kindergarten, and I had a little black boy and a little white girl who were sitting next to each other. And I watched, and he reached out, and he rubbed her arm. And she reached out, and rubbed his arm, and he reached out and touched her hair, and she reached out and touched his hair, and they sat there looking at each other, and I thought for the first time, two human beings find out they have the same skin, they have the same hair, may not feel the same. They discovered as a kindergarten baby what it was all about. And I thought, what a, I couldn't wait to get home to tell Lamar and the kids what had happened. I said, for the first time, I see what could be. I told my buddy at the school, I said, man, why do they won't let us drink? Our, uh, we can have none of that white water. And so one day, a little white kid came up and got some water. 
And I said, why does water look like my water? And that changed the narrative there. See, I actually thought when I was real young that they water was going to be like snow coming out. I was looking for some real white water. But it was <laughs> now nah, what they were saying, you can't drink at the same water fountain that they drunk out of. But when you had a sign up there that said color and white. And first, when we got to integration, it was freedom of choice was the first. And we had, I can only remember like one black boy under that freedom of choice. And then, um, I've forgotten what comes next as far as where you went. I remember that uh, about twice, maybe three times, they rang a bell, which meant that you had to take your class out to the uh, ball field or something because they had been a threat of a bomb scare, you know. And so we did that, but it was about like just two or three times. And then after just a short period of time, they, they say, yeah, y'all can come on back in now. And so there never was a bomb at Johnson Junior High School. We thought that was some student who was playing hooky. <laughs> thought he would have a good time that day. <laughs> around 1960, Anniston reached a peak population of around 33,000 people. Since then, there has been a steady decline to just under 21,000 residents. Many have expressed concerns that Anniston is dying. How to fix it? Part of the problem I see is that I, the, the city, um, or the, the, the power structure, I guess it would be the city, doesn't really ever want to hear from anybody that's not from here. I mean, they, they, I, when, I was, when I first moved here, uh, I wanted to be involved in the Main Street program because, you know, that was the big thing, and I've been involved in Main Street programs for years. I did everything I could but volunteer. I could never get anybody to get, you know, they didn't want to, they want to hear from me. You know, and and I think a lot of people. I, I had a whole group of people that were in that same boat. We we, we came here, we wanted help, and we couldn't get anybody to, to listen to us. Um, so I, I think that's there's still some of that mindset here that nobody wants to you know latch on to what what's new and and, and and good. But again, you look at us. We still have one working grocery store. We still have the center of. of banking, we still have this, the hospital down here. We have everything that this, a city needs to revitalize. We haven't lost everything. Like I've, I've dealt with some cities that have lost all that stuff and had to bring it all back. We haven't lost that yet. Many hold out hope. We have just about everything in Anniston that you could need. We've got the shopping malls now. We didn't have the shopping malls when I was growing up, but we had downtown Anniston. And uh, we're close enough to, uh, we have good doctors, we have good hospitals. Um, Anniston is just a good, small town to live in.